you will probably not be surprised to learn that today's cantata is from Bach's annual series based on Lutheran hymns, the so-called chorale cycle, dating from 1724-1725. This one takes that cycle's tendencies to an extreme. It's based on an eight stanza hymn, six of which appear in full in the Lebrun's text. Movements one, four, seven, and eight in familiar kinds of settings, a chorale presentation embedded in a concerto in the opening movement, a solo vocal chorale with instrumental obligato in movement number four, and a simple harmonization that we just heard at the end, that stanzas seven and eight in movement seven. But two chorale stanzas also appear uh, in their entirety in another guise, as recitatives, intermixed with newly written poetry, and that, of course, is movements two and five. These are so-called troped chorales, and that term is borrowed from chant studies and refers to uh, troped chants in which the existing text and music of a chant is amplified by the insertion of new words and music to go with it uh, in among the phrases and notes of the original chant. Only two stanzas of the original chorale are paraphrased in this libretto. Um, stanzas three and six are turned into aria poetry in movements three and six. And arias are the type, the musical type that least accommodates a literal chorale line. Why is that? Well, at least in Bach's typical response to the text, the presence of directly quoted chorale lines calls for the original tune, usually presented very plainly. Now, it is possible to accommodate that in an aria, and we have heard Bach do it, even though it's not easy, but it can interfere with an aria's principal musical goal, that is, expressing an affect, the human emotional state, and moving the listener's affection to that state. So Bach and his unknown librettist started this cycle of cantatas uh, with the first Sunday after Trinity in 1724. That was the compositional beginning of Bach's cantata cycles, owing to the date of his arrival in 1723, uh, an event, of course, that we have celebrated uh, 300th anniversary of in the last few months. Bach wrote about 40 pieces of the cycle, breaking off with Lent, returning only with the insertion of an older piece for the first day of Easter, for Easter Sunday, a work that was older but that could pass as a member of this uh, cycle. But it was not continued after that. It, this is thought to be because of the unavailability of texts of this type, that is, complete chorales turned into a mixed text type libretto with some paraphrases into recitatives and arias. Perhaps the text broke off because of the death of the librettist. Now, Bach did fill in some gaps later with pieces that approximate the type, including some that simply set all the stanzas of a hymn, that is, with no movements converted into recitative or aria poetry. So the first decision for the libret librettist and for Bach was the choice of a hymn for a particular liturgical date. Now, a handful of these are seasonal, especially for Advent, Christmas, and the Marian feast. You'd pick a hymn that was appropriate to that particular feast. But most of the hymns they selected are topical and not seasonal, chosen for a particular theme and that theme's relation to the gospel reading for the day. Now, this is valuable for us, those of us in the position of perhaps trying to understand these pieces, because it gives us the possibility of identifying the relationship between the chorale selected and its theme and the theme in the uh, gospel. And that can help us understand what Bach's librettist and Bach musically are after in the piece. Again, if we can identify that relationship. It gives us a good starting point from our perspective here in understanding the early 18th century theological issues and, of course, Bach's musical responses to them. So this work is for the eighth Sunday after Trinity, and that fell in 1724 on July 30th. The gospel reading from Math is from Matthew for that day. It's in several sections, but it begins with a warning. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Inside, rather, they are ravening wolves. Beware of false prophets who come in sheep's clothing. Inside, rather, they are ravening wolves. Lutheran commentary from Luther's time up to Bach's took this to be a caution against hypocrisy and false teaching. But more importantly, this idea was absorbed 
into a fundamental element of the Lutheran stance. And that is that the Lutheran church was under constant threat and attack. Luther, Luther's own commentary on this passage goes even further. He says that anyone who does not have haters, persecutors, and enemies is not yet really a Christian, or at the least has not acknowledged or outwardly expressed his Christianity with sufficient deed and understanding. This was understood, this was taken to be a natural state of the Lutheran Christian. So this text speaks to a fundamental tenet of Lutheran sense of their place in the world, and that place was as under attack by enemies and persecuted. Now the original context of Jesus' scriptural warning, the one quoted by Matthew, is of course against a warning against the Jewish authorities. Luther saw this as a parallel to a contemporary threat from those who called themselves Christians, but who were actually wolves offering false teachings. By your fruits you shall know them, continues the gospel reading. And those fruits were clearly represented to Luther and those who followed him in what they considered the false teachings of other so-called Christians. You will not be surprised to learn where this was headed. The biggest threat, the identity of this element, this wolf in sheep's clothing, was from the Pope and the so-called Papists who followed him. But also, interestingly enough, according to late 17th century commentators, also from Calvinists and from Quakers, who similarly represented false teachers, wolves in sheep's clothing. All of them were said to present themselves as true prophets who were able to take in the foolish populace with their outward signs of piety and what Luther and later commentators call their sweet talk. Now, given this background, that is, the meaning of the gospel for contemporary Lutherans, it is not so difficult to understand the choice of hymn for the cantata for this day, the hymn Wo Gott der Herr nicht bei uns hält. This is from the very earliest layer of Lutheran chorales. It was published, in fact, in 1524 in the so-called so Erfurt and Caridion, um, and the, one of the very first, in fact, the very earliest surviving um, Lutheran hymnal. Uh, it is by Justus Jonas, an associate of Luther, and the early lore around this hymn said that the hymn had been edited and improved by Martin Luther himself. Now, the hymn is a poetic paraphrase and enlargement of Psalm 124, which begins, If the Lord were not with us when people set themselves against us, they would have swallowed us alive when their anger flared against us. Luther's commentary on this psalm emphasizes present danger, not just the past danger understood to be discussed by the psalmist, but present danger to anyone who reads this, and especially to Lutherans who read it. This was in fact one of two early hymns on this psalm. Luther himself wrote one, Wer Gott nicht mit uns dieser Zeit, also published in 1524. Both of these hymns tellingly are categorized as hymns of the Christian church. So both these pieces, for Gott der Herr bei uns hält, and Wer Gott nicht mit uns dieser Zeit, are both characterized as hymns of the Christian church, that is, staking out this position of a Lutheran church as having enemies and being persecuted. So our hymn dilates on the rage of the enemy, but is specific in identifying that enemy, those who call themselves Christian and clothe themselves in God's name. And God's intervention is what stops both their raging and their false teachings. So here's the relevance of the eighth Sunday after Trinity. The gospel reading is taken to be about present day threats to the church from enemies who seek its destruction and who seek the death of its followers, specifically non-Lutheran Christians. And God's protection promised in this Psalm is God's defense of his true church. So now I think we might be in a position to understand some of the things that go on in this cantata's libretto and music. First of all, the literal use of so many chorale stanzas, an unusual proportion in this piece. That's an act of homage, among other things, to this ancient chorale with ties to Luther and to the first years of the Reformation. And of course, the chorale text makes ex the connection explicit between the threat to believers and the church on the one hand and the identity of the enemy on the other, the chorale's blunt original language is retained. 
Note especially movement four, stanza four, they lie in wait as though we were heretics. They pride themselves as Christians too. They must be using your precious name as their cloak of evil. And you can see the direct parallel to the gospel's warning about uh, uh, people who come as wolf in sheep's clothing. They must be using God's precious name as their cloak of evil. And in movement five, it's made literal, God will subvert their false teaching. And the setting makes especially clear uh, of this movement number four, uh, makes this especially clear. It's a two oboe ritonello, but the solo tenor line is completely unadorned melodically. It, it would, you cannot imagine a setting, I think, in which it would be easier to hear the very specific, and I have to say very blunt words of this choral stanza. A second point, we can understand the musical vehemence of the opening movement. Clearly a reflection of the enemy's raging mentioned in the text. Notice all the military language. The enemy, the rage, the, our battle cause, protection, stratagem. It starts with a ritornello in the minor mode, opening with an oboe, striking oboe dissonance. There are three musical layers in this ritornello. Relentless fast notes starting in the oboes, a sharp rhythmic figure in the strings, and a percussive ba bass line. These ideas migrate, swapped among the instruments over the course of the movement, relentlessly presenting this image of rage. This ritornello and the material derived from it supports chorale phrases. Chorale line one and his musical repeat in chorale line three are presented in a relatively simple harmonization, but lines two and four in the voices start to incorporate the turbulent activity Bach has presented in the ritornello. Lines five and after begin to incorporate that percussive bass line, and the last vocal phrase of the chorale is as active and vehement and arguably violent as the instrumental lines have been all along. The musical vehemence of this setting has thoroughly infected the voices by the end of the chorale that they present. Third, we can consider the rage aria number three. It takes up an image from the psalm and the hymn, the idea of waters overcoming a ship which are likened to an enemy's overwhelming the victim. Here, the librettist draws on a familiar Lutheran image and, as, and metaphor, the church as Jesus's little ship. So the general image of the psalm and the hymn, the, the ocean storm that overwhelms a victim, is here interpreted specifically as about a threat to the church because of the familiarity of this image. And you see this all the time in emblems and uh, political broadsides with illustrations, um, the Lutheran church um, illustrated as, and depicted as a ship on a stormy sea. Here, uh, it's made specific by means of this metaphor. In the musical setting, we have a rolling unison violin obligato with a pulsating instrumental bass line and a florid active vocal bass. It's a classic rage aria in a particular type that invokes a sea storm. Then we have the striking and unsettling aria number six with its offbeat accents and large leaps. And those accents on various beats um, come in various musical lines. So the accents on odd and sometimes unpredictable beats come from every direction. There's a really interesting textual topic here. The command that's on, this, um, on these offbeats is, and when the instruments play it, you associate it with this too, with the command schweig. Now you can't really express that command schweig in English in one syllable. It's something like hush, but without the gentle um, overtones of hush. It, it's something more angry. It's like, shut the heck up. <laughs> right? but, in, but, in one, but in one percussive syllable, right? Um, and the topic here is interesting. This command to be silent is addressed to reason personified. And reason says that even the godly are doomed. But this, argue, this aria text argues that statement is false. Salvation is indeed promised to whom? To believers, those who hope in Jesus, the faithful. Now the theme here is the opposition of faith and reason. And notice that this is stated explicitly in movement seven, where it says reason fights, reason battles against faith. This became a central topic of 18th century the uh, theology and philosophy, what the relationship was between reason and faith. 
Um, it's also worth considering if you are inclined to view Johann Sebastian Bach as modern and enlightened, as many commentators have been over the years. At the very least, I would say a text like this suggests that it, at least the texts he set to music entirely contradict that modern, enlightened, rationalistic view. This says exactly the opposite. The reason is to be silent and then only faith, and then it is fighting against faith, and only faith in Lutheran is the path to salvation. Finally, musically, we've got these two troped chorales that I mentioned before, a chorale that have, whose text has been amplified with newly written poetic words designed to be set as recitatives. And in fact, Bach sets these as recits that include the chorale lines. They include, as you can see, complete stanzas. And Bach setting makes it clear, Bach, both of Bach settings makes it clear what's chorale and what's newly written poetry. In the original chorale lines, Bach uses the hymn melody um, it's, it's present, it's sung, and it is metrically regular. In the first, you get the plain chorale in slow notes, supported by a motivic bass line that's drawn as it happens, this being Bach, from the sped up first notes of each chorale phrase in turn. In turn. The new poetic lines, though, are presented in a speech-like declamation that we usually associate with simple recitative. Number two puts that chorale all in one voice, the alto, Number five, the other troped chorale is striking for the way it uses a full four-voice chorale harmonization, just like the one we hear from all the voices and all the instruments at the very end of the cantata, with interpolated recitative lines rotating among bass, tenor, and alto. And Bach introduces a rhythmic figure in the accompaniment from the beginning that runs all the way through. Now, that rhythmic accompaniment in this movement spans both the chorale and the recitative lines. It accompanies both of them, both the metrically regular four-part chorale phrases and the more uh, roughly speech-like recitative settings of the free poetry. It's, um, so it's emblematic, this um, bass line, is presumably emblematic of the murderous roaring that is described at the start. But interestingly enough, this is the chorale stanza that pivots, just as the uh, psalm does, from this warning of danger to the praise of God. And this is helpfully troped by the, uh, the poet in an absolutely marvelous uh, one-word, two-syllable interjection by the tenor, jedoch, but, but, it says, and that's the pivot moment of our entire piece, right? But what's interesting is that that uh, rhythmic accompaniment figure that Bach introduces, that first is associated with the vehemence and the rage of the enemy, it starts that way, but by the end, it, I think it stands for the vehemence and the vigor of God's retaliation against the enemy's false teaching. And without realizing it, you're made to hear it first one way and then the other, and that vehemence carries all the way through. So, if we take a step back from all these details, we have an interesting problem here of the interpretation of historical works. Now, you arguably cannot understand much of Bach's musical treatment, or even understand much of the librettist choice of this chorale, or the librettist choice in the way he expands it, without knowing the scriptural and theological context. You can't really make sense of some of these musical features, like the ferocity of the opening chorus, at least if you want to go beyond, well, Bach musically illustrates the text. It mentions rage, so we'll do something rage, right? Or to make sense of the stern warning about reason when faith is what's actually required. Or the two chorales trope with recitatives that present their entire stanzas. Um, it's hard to imagine how you really make musical sense and textual sense of this without understanding the context. But I have to say, it would seem that almost nobody who performs this piece or translates its text, or writes about it on the internet, uh, knows this, knows this background. <laughs> so leaving aside one web commentator who calls this piece a disappointment, <laughs> for many of, the, many of the reasons, well, there's too many repetitions of the chorale and so on. Leaving that aside, they all do get something from this piece. Most of them say, yeah, this has got some good stuff in it. But that, that raises a really interesting interpretive question. Um, do they get the wrong thing? I mean, is their appreciation of this piece you know, wrong in somehow? Um, I was discussing this problem this week with the director of the Bloomington Early Music Festival, in fact. Um, 
And she pointed out that there were actually close parallels to the temptation to interpret music or the culture of some present day other, not a necessarily historical other, but some present day other, on the assumption that we know how they must react and feel to certain you know, cultural artifacts. Um, there's the perpetual risk if you assume that your, our own perspective on something is everybody else's perspective, whether you're talking about that other's perspective or historical perspective. Because Orthodox Lutherans of the early 18th century are a very, very long way from us. Even those of you, for example, whose home is this modern day Lutheran church, they're, they're a long way from us. There's this risk of, of interpreting something in a way that reflects more our understanding um, and the risk finding ourselves in historical work. Now, I guess there's nothing wrong with that, but as soon as you say or write what Bach is doing here is, and then offer that kind of interpretation, you've created a historical and interpretive problem for yourself, right? Maybe you should have some basis for saying, this is what Bach and his apparatus have in mind here, right? Uh, again, I'm not sure that anybody's doing anything wrong by interpreting it in, in any other way, but when you have a sentence like that that says what Bach is after, then this raises, for me, this very interesting historical problem. I do not claim, uh, in the slightest, to have all the answers or all the historical understandings of this piece, but I am offering, I think, to all of us here, a way to listen to this piece that Bach and his contemporaries might well have recognized. And I urge you to try out that perspective. Thank you.